Um, it says we're back. I'm just going to get the paint window up so I can have somewhere to draw. Um, and then if you guys see anything wrong with the screen, just let me know. I It's hard to tell what uh, is missing on the edges when it is sent to YouTube because the YouTube window is a little bit smaller than what's actually sent. So I will get paint up here and there we go alright so like I said I will be talking about quantum entanglement and um, so and that may be a little uh, daunting of a topic on the surface, so uh, I hope to um, bring shed some light on the whole idea, because I feel as though um, a lot of people just assume that quantum, um, that topics like quantum mechanics and uh, special relativity are way out of their spectrum of possible knowledge and although there are aspects of those to uh, of those higher topics uh, that are rather hard to grasp the overall application and um, logic behind them is a little simpler than what people usually expect and the way I uh, always claim is for, for special relativity is that the uh, concept is actually harder to grasp than the math. Um, now that's a little different with quantum mechanics because of the ne necessity of um, a idea of vector spaces and this is a somewhat higher math uh, concept but I hope to give a general explanation of uh, what it means to have uh, of some more general quantum topics and give you guys some ideas of what the whole uh, the whole area of of uh, the whole school of thought is so the first thing that anyone learns in in terms of quantum mechanics and you may have heard of this already is the whole Schrodinger's cat uh, metaphor. So that is the idea that um, if you have this box here and you have it's a three-dimensional box because boxes are voluminous, if that's a word. Uh, so there's a box here and there's a cat in the box. And so what is significant about this is that you do not know what is going on inside the box until you open it. So, this is a cat. Um, I will warn the animal lovers, this is somewhat of a morbid dis uh, metaphor. But, it gets the job done. So, there's this cat here. They call it Schrodinger's cat. And so when the cat is in the box, there's also a capsule in the box with a random timer on it um, that will uh, randomly open and release gases killing the cat. Or it doesn't have to be a capsule, it can be any means of killing this cat. Um, but the whole idea is that the time aspect of it is completely random. So it could be one millisecond, it could be 10 billion years. You have no idea when this capsule opens and kills this cat. So in terms of um, in terms of applying your knowledge about this box, until you open the box and see if the cat is alive or dead, you can't claim that it is either. So, you have to 
uh, you have to make decisions based off of the fact that uh, the cat here is in a superposition of alive and dead. So the, what a superposition means is that it is uh, it is both alive and dead, or it is um, or you can think of it as any possible combination. So it's it's either alive or dead, but you don't know which one it is. So it's both, and that's a little hard to grasp, but it it makes sense in um, how you apply it. So this this could apply to a social topic in a sense. So let's say gender identity. A lot of there's a lot of talk about gender identity. So before you know what someone uh, affiliates uh, or how someone feels about gender, then you shouldn't act as if they are one specific until you comfortably understand uh, what that person feels comfortable with. So um, that's this is the the metaphor of Schrodinger's cat, and that explains superposition, which is um, not one uh, static state, but a uh, sort of a combination of uh, the the two states and the lack thereof. Um, we see some uh, some superpositions coming into play in some, uh, or I believe it's uh, chemical states. So if there's oh not chemical states, chemical structures. So if you have uh, a particle that is like this, and then it has a singular bond here and a double bond here, then. Um, the double bond could either be here or it could be on the other side so then you have the same thing but it's mirrored and these are both the same and have both the same probability of happening so what happens is when it comes to applying math to these structures you have to imagine that they are constantly fluctuating between this state and this state so you treat them as if they're in somewhere in between where the um, the bond length is slightly smaller than a single bond but slightly larger than a double bond now this isn't necessarily what people would normally consider as uh, it, it could be technically quantum but um, the the scale of magnitude is not necessarily quantum in effect. So uh, I'm going to clear the slate here. Um, so the idea of a quantum effect is uh, when things get really small. So you have buildings, that's macro scale, so you got windows, and yeah, so you get it. Dot, 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 dot. And then um, so that's macro scale, and then micro scale would be um, would be even smaller than that. You could say microorganisms are micro scale. You could even go smaller, saying that a molecule is micro scale. But then, when you want to get quantum, you have to get to particles. So that's electrons. Um, electrons are the one of the best. Uh, examples of something that that uh, follows quantum mechanics so when you when it comes to applying physics to an electron you can't follow the normal Newtonian rules of F equals MA and all the the Newton's laws so the different rules that apply are the quantum mechanics so um, I'm trying to think of where to start here. So the way that electrons work. So there's many different ways you can explain an electron. Electrons have mass. I believe that's uh, some 9.11 times 10 to the negative 31. Uh, someone can correct me on that if I'm wrong. 
and then they have uh, an electrical charge which is uh, I, it's 1.6 times uh, I think it's negative 12, maybe even more um, so they're, they're they have a, a decent charge but their uh, major effect is in numbers and so uh, electrons obviously play a count in electricity because it's flowing charge but if you know anything about electricity and uh, electrostatics and magnetism is that um, when you have uh, a moving charge you get a magnetic field so that's if uh, so electrons you can imagine them as a little particle and w the way that a lot of people will describe uh, will, will add an at a characteristic to an electron is they'll uh, describe its spin so you can imagine this little particle spinning around in circles in space and the thing is if you have uh, a charge that is spinning you can imagine it's somewhat like having a circular wire so here's your wire and having a uh, a charge on that wire moving around in that circle so what happens is uh, when you have a circular uh, a loop of wire with a charge moving around it uh, with a current or um, which is what a moving charge is um, you get a uh, magnetic field coming uh, out of that ring so magnetic fields uh, work perpendicular to the direction of the charge, the direction of motion of the charge, and they um, they curl. Um, so there's a, a right hand rule. So if you hold up your right hand and you point your thumb in the direction of the charge, uh, the direction of the motion of the charge, then you can curl your the rest of your fingers, and that is how the uh, magnetic field works so it, it curls around the wire like that so in this case the electric field would be curling around the uh, wire like this but then if you think about a the charge being over here it's still moving in this direction around the wire but um, in this instance it is moving down so if you hold your right hand and point your thumb down, it's kind of an awkward angle to get your um, elbow that way. But you can see that the uh, your fingers will curl around this way. And so what happens is all of the magnetic field flows through, or the, the flux of the magnetic field is in this direction through the ring. And so what happens is if you see a particle like this one and it's rotating and it has a charge, it basically is a, a infinite number of infinitesimally small rings of charge uh, spinning around in circles. So what happens is when you get a spin like this, uh, what I'm showing here, then you can do your right hand rule and what happens is uh, the magnetic field it creates is downwards. So, um, people in the scientific community would describe this uh, particle, which we're saying is an electron just for simplicity's sake, would have a uh, spin of down. Now, the confusing part is the fact that, uh, so, let's just imagine you had a ball a ball doesn't always rotate around a vertical axis. A, a ball could rotate around a horizontal axis, it could rotate around a, uh, a third Z axis that's pointing outwards, or it could rotate in any axis in between those uh, coordinate axes. So it doesn't, it's not necessarily restricted to that axis. And what happens is, um, so to explain something as up or uh, so you can have one that's up or one that's down is somewhat limited you would think in um, how uh, in how many different ways 
a an electron could be spinning. But um, this will all be explained in a bit here. Um, I, the whole idea of this is a little bit hard to grasp, so I'm trying to cover all of the basis. So um, we'll just say for now, we'll accept for now, that this electron has an, a spin of up or down. So there are two possible states of this electron. So the problem of, uh, so, all right, I have to explain something else before I get ahead of myself. So, if a uh, if you have a ring like this, uh, oh, I'll get I'll get black, so it matches the wire we have. If you have a ring like this, and you put it in, and uh, so let's say that it has um, it has a magnetic field like this. Um, just imagine that all of the lines coming out of that ring are in that direction and then you make a magnet here and a magnet here so that all of the um, so that it's a, a field of magnetism I'm gonna make this blue so it stands out compared to the red one so you get a, a magnetic field going from one magnet to the other and this ring is suspended in this magnetic field. Now, uh, the the thing with magnets is they are attracted to each other based off of um, their polarity. So, um, the when you think of a ring uh, in terms of a bar magnet, so if you had a a uh, a magnet like this that had a, a plus and a minus then um, a ring would be like a ring around this bar magnet and so the plus end is where the arrows are pointing in a sense so uh, the plus end would be here and so uh, I may have the magnetic field direction wrong but uh, let's say um, let's say we have a, a, the plus up here and the minus down here. So this ring is kind of up. It's kind, it's, it's kind of pointed towards the plus end, but then uh, since the, the way the arrow is pointing is the plus end here, um, when it comes to magnets, opposites attract. So the minus will attract the plus end, and the plus will end attract the minus end. So what this ring will want to do is rotate this way, and put itself in a state where it is as close to where the plus end is as close to the minus end as possible, and the minus end is as close to the plus end as possible. And we'll imagine that it's perfectly in the middle, so it uh, doesn't immediately fling to one side it uh, stays suspended but it does rotate around its central axis um, so that it aligns with the magnetic field and in order to do this it requires work so um, if you know anything about conservation of energy there is no perpetual motion there is no uh, just random motion everything requires an uh, an equivalent amount of energy to occur. So the oh, I'm sorry about that. The uh, motion of rotating this ring requires that a magnetic potential is great enough to do so. So this this magnetic potential it's somewhat like how if you have if you want a ball to drop and hit the ground, um, that's the ground. If you want it to drop and hit the ground, then it needs to have a gravitational potential. So we say that's mg usually, um, and that's well, that's the force of of uh, no, that's the uh, acceleration. Oh no, no, yeah, yeah, that's the force due to gravity on the particle. So um, so because g is the acceleration, but um, a gravitational potential is just 
one type of potential, you can create a magnetic potential and the way you create potentials is by putting energy in ahead of time. So the energy that caused this to be able to accelerate downwards was the initial energy of bringing the ball up to that place in the first place. Um, so that doesn't necessarily have to happen at the same time. It can. It could have been brought there a billion years ago and then now it just drops. So um, that energy was put in and then it was created into potential energy and then the potential energy is converted back. So with this ring a magnetic potential energy is created and then the um, ring uh, the ring converts that magnetic potential into a uh, into kinetic energy and rotates to align with the magnetic field now this would be a small spike in um, in order to do this you would need instead of having just a constant magnetic field you'd have to spike the magnetic field but the uh, but the spike would be so minuscule that it would be relatively constant in terms of um, how that you would read on uh, meters so what happens in terms of uh, electrons is when an electron rotates like this or when a, when a particle rotates like this, um, it has it has received energy, so now it has to spit that energy out. So what it does is, since an electron um, can, it, if we give it energy, it has to spit out energy. And what that energy is is a photon. Uh, it's an electromagnetic wave. Um, well it would be a photon is uh, part of an electromagnetic wave or uh, it's a difficult topic to explain but um, so it, the electron when it realigns with this magnetic field it releases a photon now the power of this photon uh, if we were talking about this ring that is at least somewhat macroscopic the um, the magnitude of that photon would be based off of this angle here. So we have this angle based off of how it is to the horizontal. And we'll say that's theta because that's the main thing that is used for angles. Um, so the, the photon, let's say that this uh, ring would give off, would be um, would be a fun the magnitude of it would be a function of this angle here and what is weird when we deal with the quantum aspect of electrons uh, electrons is that the photon is always the same magnitude so you may say that's strange and it is strange in terms of normal classical uh, physics but in terms of quantum uh, quantum physics everything works out so I will uh, get to that in a second so um, I'm going to uh, let me see if there's anything I want to add on to in this picture um, no, I'll, I'll clean the slate here, so um, bear with me. All right, so like I was saying, when you put an electron in a magnetic field, and we'll say that the magnetic field's going this way, and so then you put the magnetic potential in, the electron gains some energy, and in order to realign itself it has to release this photon out. So what happens with quantum uh, in quantum mechanics is that um, if the so the way that quantum mechanics makes up for the fact that this photon here 
is always the same magnitude is by um, it comes back to that idea of superposition so we can't really see electrons at least at the moment with our current technology we can't uh, visualize electrons um, so because we can't observe them we can't claim that they are rotating one way or another per se unless we do experiments um, like the one I'm talking about um, so when you put it when you put a um, electron in this field then it will align with the field one way or another and so if you had previously aligned it with this field that is over on an angle let's say a 45 degree angle or something so that that's 45 degrees um, then you move it to this uh, to you move it from this field into this field over here then what happens is that instead of it being um, instead of it being 100% instead of you being 100% certain that this electron will align one way or the other based off of what spin it has to uh, and then release a photon that is a function of this angle here of 45 instead of that being certain you have a probability of the electron either firing a photon of the of the constant magnitude of, of electrons firing photons or not firing a photon at all and when an electron does fire the photon then you know which way it is aligned when it doesn't fire the photon you know it is aligned in the opposite direction in terms of spin and uh, it's this probability that evens out the fact that the photon is constant so if we imagine that uh, you have a bunch of electrons in a big group and you put them all in the the first um, magnetic field and align them and then you move them all to the second magnetic field this probability will mean that only um, only that probability of or that percentage of electrons will fire the photons and so then in total on a macroscopic scale the amount of energy that is released is a function of the angle but the individual uh, quantum sized particles um, the uh, experience of them is a little harder to grasp your hand uh, get your head around because of this random probability of of releasing this photon so that is the general um, brush up on quantum on the whole quantum aspect of of um, electrons and I'm sure I didn't uh, give the best description of it I can always explain more if you guys have any questions um, so I'll try and summarize in general so Superposition means that it, you can't claim that it's one or the other. You have to claim that it is fluctuating constantly and infinite, infinitely between one and the other. So at any point in time, it is both and none. And so um, the a a a, a good uh, application of this is so. Let's say you have two slits; they're very close together to where diffraction happens and the diffraction is when uh, light goes through or when a, a particle goes through um, 
when a particle goes through a uh, slit that is very small, then it uh, can diffract at an angle um, based off of how how far apart those slits are. Um, so then what the electrons do is when you fire an electron at the two slits, then you must claim that it, you must consider that the electron has gone through slit one you must consider that the electron has gone through slit 2, that it has gone through both slits, and that it has not gone through either of the slits. And so it is a superposition of all possibilities. Until you observe it, and by observe it, in this case that I've shown, um, until you see that photon and you pick it up on a reader, you have to consider that it released a photon and it didn't release a photon so that it is either up or down but um, once you see the photon then you know that the electron is in the orientation of a line uh, that that is aligned to be I believe up with the um, with the field so um, that's superposition, so then the uh, electron's spin is based off of a mag the magnetic field created by a rotating charge, and the electron it, um, will align with a magnetic field based off of a probability of the angle to which it was originally aligned. Now, this uh, this experiment assumes that you have already figured out what direction the electron is aligned in, so you have primed it with this original direction. And then when you put it into, um, and the way you prime something, if you leave it long enough, it will align with the magnetic field. Um, so then once the electron is primed you can move it into the second electro uh, the magnetic field and it has a probability based off of this um, this degree of the angle to um, either fire off the photon or not and uh, then so it can switch between up and down uh, with a random probability so that's the general idea of the quantum aspect of an electron and um, so I mentioned that I was going to talk about quantum entanglement and so I will get a new slate here and quantum entanglement is uh, you may be able to guess from the title when you have more than one quantum particle interacting with each other so let's say we have an electron and let's say we have another electron so this one's the red one and this one is the blue one and that's not normally the color you would color in electrons but we've never seen them so I'm going to call them red and blue so we don't know about these electrons um, we okay so I can't say that we've primed both of these electrons in the same magnetic field so we know that they are both primed and also um, we are claiming and for uh, explanation purposes I'm not going to leave any gray area these electrons are entangled so I'm just gonna draw this as a visualization so let's say these two particles, uh, electrons, are quantumly entangled. And so if we've primed them in the same magnetic field, then alone they should have the same probability of, um, of being up or down when placed in the new magnetic field. Um, so I'm not going to draw all the arrows, but you guys get the picture. So, if this um, 
if this entanglement were not here, then, like I said, with the group of electrons, these two would have this one would have the probability based off of the angle of the priming magnetic field um, of being up or down, and this one would also have that probability, and they would be independent. So, uh, if this one was up, and you knew that, it wouldn't change what this uh, this particle is in terms of spin. So, the difference with entanglement is that when you have electrons that are entangled, then let's say we know they're entangled, and then we um, keep this one here, and then we take this one over here and we put it in a box and we mail it all the way across the universe to a new solar system and give it to our friend that we know there somehow so this electron is no longer here it's in the box so we're gonna put it over here and we haven't done anything in terms of new magnetic fields and we haven't uh, allowed it to entangle with anything else so now this one's in the box and we can't see it and we give it to our friend then um, so we can do the normal experiment with this uh, with this particle and um, so if we do the normal experiment then we turn on the electric uh, the magnetic field and we look for a photon if we see the photon then um, then we're uh, so I'm gonna say that means the electron is up is spinning up so if we see the photon and we can say that this electron is spinning up so we're gonna say up then w immediately because these are entangled and this is just the trait of entanglement we know that the other electron is spinning down and this is simply because they're entangled I do not have the knowledge nor the capability to explain why this occurs um, and I, I will uh, shout out some videos at the end that might be able to uh, give you some more insight on that um, so if two particles are entangled and you measure one as up then you know 100 percent certain that the other one is down so even though this one over here in the box is all the way across the universe in a different solar system, in a different galaxy, in a different part of the universe, uh, we know that this uh, electron is up, so we know that the other one is down, and we don't even have to check it. But um, if our friend in the other universe, it, it, not in the other universe, in the uh, where, if our friend that has the box, let's just forget the whole moving it far away. Um, goes to measure this we will know before they measure it that this one is down and um, but in terms of uh, probability until unless we tell the if we call the person up and um, go tell the person that's not a piece of poop that's a phone um, that the R electron was up, then the probability is still the same for them because there's no, um, it's it's not uh, they're not taking into account the the other the results of the first electron. But if we call them, then they know that the probability is 100% of it happening. So this is the whole idea of quantum entanglement. And like I said, I am not the uh, I'm not an expert in any way on this topic. I'm trying to just give a general overview of it. Um, so 
there are some videos that are available to you if you want to learn more um, uh, in terms of the more in-depth mathematics behind uh, quantum entanglement and those videos are out of Stanford there's uh, I believe um, there's a, a almost a whole class um, of lectures on on YouTube here um, that are completely open for you to go view um, and uh, so they I will post at least the first one in the description um, of the video after I uh, after this is uploaded and you can go check that out if you want to learn more if you uh, really want me to try and give a more in-depth description you can let me know about that either in the comments on this video or in on Twitter um, I'm not sure how much further I would be able to explain on this topic but I am willing to give it my best and do some more personal research in order to give a better description to you guys if you truly wish to uh, learn more but I would recommend those videos although I will say that they are uh, relatively intensive in the terms of abstract math so if you have trouble um, grasping some more uh, abstract mathematical concepts they may be a little bit out of uh, your uh, realm of preference in terms of learning but they are interesting at, at the least so um, like I said I will put them in the description so I've been talking for a while here uh, I'm gonna put it to a commercial and then I will do the normal segment that I've been doing on my Saturday streams where I draw a random picture based off of random words so I will be right back uh, in the meantime, enjoy a word from YouTube sponsors.